Kia ora, good morning everyone, Rich Wong here, welcome back to the channel. Today we are looking at this really special lens from Lawa. There are many reasons why it is a special lens. First, it is the lens to celebrate Lawa's 10th anniversary. Happy 10th birthday Lawa! Second, it is Lawa's first autofocus lens. Yes, after 10 years, Lawa has finally created their first ever autofocus lens. Third, it's a really wide lens. It is a 10mm full-frame retinilinear lens. This is the widest autofocus retinilinear full-frame lens in the market. The only other autofocus retinilinear lens that is just as wide is the Canon RF 10-20 f4L lens that we have reviewed not too long ago. But compared to the Canon which is a f4 lens, this lens has an even faster f2.8 maximum aperture, so this lens is one stop faster. So each of these three things could already make this a special lens, but all together it just make it a super special lens. The first thing I want to talk about is something that could be a little bit confusing. I mentioned before that this is Lauer's first autofocus lens, and this lens is available in Sony E, Nikon Z, Canon RF, and Leica L Mount as well. Now, the thing that may be a bit confusing is, for Nikon Z and Sony E shooters, there is an autofocus version which has the 5 aperture brace design. But there's also a many focus version which has 14 aperture brace design. For Canon RF and Leica L Mount users, this lens is only available as a manual focus lens. You still have two choices, either the 5 aperture braid or the 14 aperture braids, but both of them are manual focus only. But apart from the different aperture braids and the mount, the optics for all the different versions are exactly the same. So in terms of image quality, all the different versions should be pretty much the same apart from two areas, but I will explain that to you a little bit later on in this review. This is not the first time Lauer create different versions for the same lens, but with different aperture braid design. It is quite interesting as while it does offer more choice to the customers, it must have also created a bit of confusion and complications as well. But anyway, if you want to purchase this lens, you need to decide very carefully which version is best for you as each of them has their own pros and cons and more suitable for some certain type of photography. An interesting thing is, the price for the autofocus and many focus version are exactly the same price at 799 US dollar, which I think is not a bad price considering the Canon RF 10 to 20 f4 is $2,299, which is like three times the price of this lower. But I thought the autofocus version would be a bit more expensive than the manual focus version. So that seems a bit interesting that Lauer priced them the same. I want to talk a little bit about how wide a 10mm full frame lens is. I remember when I first started doing photography, 16mm was already considered ultra wide and it's like very very wide, 16mm. But now, this lens is 6mm wider. While 6mm doesn't sound like a lot, but when we talk about ultra wide angle lenses, even 1mm difference is very noticeable. The official field of view for this 10mm lens is 130.4 degree, while a 16mm lens is usually around 107 degrees. But just looking at the numbers alone cannot really tell you how big the actual difference is. So here is a photo I shot in this room at 16mm and now this is the 10mm photo I shot using the lower lens. The 10mm is much wider than a 16mm photo. It kind of makes 16mm ultra wide angle shot looks not that wide at all. 10mm is just such a wide angle lens. So it makes it very hard to judge the image quality because I haven't shot with that many 10mm lens before. So for me to tell if this lower 10mm lens image quality is good or not, I got the Canon RF 10-20 f4L lens to do some comparison. 
the Canon RF10 to 20 f4L is the only full frame rectilinear autofocus lens that can reach 10 mm focal length. The lower 10 mm lens sample I receive is for the Nikon Mount, and I'm testing it using my Nikon Z6, which has a 24 megapixel full frame sensor. And with the Canon RF10 to 20 f4L lens, I chose to use the Canon RP camera body which has a slightly higher 26.2 megapixel sensor. So the resolution is not identical, but I consider the difference is not really that big as the difference in linear resolution is only 3%. Okay, now we look at the image sharpness first. At f2.8, the center sharpness is decent, but we can improve it if we stop down the lens to f5.6, then the center is now very sharp. If we continue to stop down the lens, the sharpness remains the same until we reach f16 and it becomes softer due to diffraction. Corner is a bit soft at f2.8, then it becomes sharper as we stop down the lens. At f8, the corner becomes very sharp. I find focus the photo at the corner would improve the corner sharpness a bit. And if I do that, I can get really sharp corner at f5.6 already, which suggests this lens has a little bit of field curvature. If we compare it with the Canon RF 10 to 20 f4L lens at 10 mm focal length, since the Canon is a f4 lens, so let's start the comparison from f4. The center sharpness is very sharp at f4 for both lenses. I think the lower may be slightly sharper at f4, but the difference is very minimal. And once we start to stop down the lens, then there's virtually no difference in terms of center sharpness. If you look at the corner at f4, both lenses are quite similar. Both are a little bit soft. However, with the lower lens, it would become sharper and sharper as we stop down the lens while the Canon's corner sharpness doesn't improve too much even when we stop down the lens. So if you need very good corner sharpness, I will stop down the lower slightly and that would give you very good center to corner sharpness even better than the Canon. The minimum focus distance of this lower lens is 12 cm or 4.7 inches and the official figure says the maximum magnification ratio is 0 0.24 times which is really good. With such good magnification and the ultra wide field of view, I had a lot of fun doing my Lego photography using this lens because it can create a lot of photos that I just can't do with my typical 100 or even 60 millimeter macro lenses. I got a very, very wide view angle, which give me a very different perspective. And because of its very wide focal length, the depth of field is much deeper than the typical longer focal length macro lenses. So I don't have to stop down the lens too much and still have enough depth of view. Actually, some of the photos I shot, I didn't stop down the lens at all. So it makes it a lot easier to do some handheld macro or close-up photos as I don't have to worry too much about not able to keep the shutter speed fast enough to avoid motion blur. Not having to stop down the lens means I get a lot of light into the sensor. So that makes it a lot easier to do handheld macro photos because I don't have to worry about not able to keep the shutter speed fast enough to avoid motion blur. However, one problem of shooting close-up photo with this lens, or actually any ultra wide angle to do any kind of close-up photo is, you don't really have too much working distance, which means the distance between your subject and the front of the lens. Even after I remove the lens hood, there is only around 2.5 cm or 1 inch between the subject and the front element when I'm shooting at minimum focus distance. That means I have to be really careful and don't bump the lens into my subject when I'm adjusting the camera position. It also means I can cast shadow very easily onto the subject. So I always have to either shoot in a shadow area or the light has to be behind the subject. 
And if you want to light up the scene using your own lights, it's also very difficult because of such close working distance and also the ultra wide field of view. So the light can easily get into the photo. So it does create some challenges. But if you manage to work around these challenges, then the result is very rewarding. I mentioned at the beginning that this lens has two versions. One has the 5 aperture brace design and one has the 14 aperture brace. The 5 aperture brace version is what I received from Lawa and using this review. With this version, once you stop down the lens even just a little bit, the bokeh balls would turn into pentagon shape. So if you are planning to use this lens for close-up photos and don't really like the pentagon shape bokeh, you should consider the 14 aperture brace version instead, which will give you more round bokeh when you stop down the lens. And let's compare with the Canon RF 10 to 20 lens. If you look at this side by side comparison photo with the Canon lens set at 10 mm and both lenses shoot at the minimum focus distance, the lower gives you much higher magnification ratio. The Canon seems slightly sharper at the same aperture, but since the lower gives us much higher maximum magnification, so I think the lower is overall a better lens for close-up photos. Lower calls this lens a 0D lens, which means it has very low amount of distortion. And indeed, this lens has very small amount of distortion. Maybe not exactly zero distortion, but for a 10mm focal length lens, the distortion is extremely small. If we compare the photo shot with the Canon RF 10 to 20 at 10 mm, the Canon also looks pretty good, very similar. But if we look at the top of the photo where the balconies are, there is a bit of pink cushion distortion with the Canon lens. However, one very important difference between these two photos is that the photo from the Canon lens is with the lens profile correction already applied. If I disable the profile correction, the Canon looks pretty distorted. I won't go as far as saying the Canon is a fisheye lens, but there is some really strong barrel distortion once I turn off the software correction. And the Canon lens also seems to be actually slightly wider, but because of the large amount of distortion and also the image circle seems doesn't completely cover all the way to the corner, so Canon has to apply some large amount of distortion correction and a bit of cropping to get rid of most of the distortion and make the corner usable. But anyway, if we look at the original uncorrected photo from the Canon and put it next to the lower, now we can see the lower is really excellent. At f2.8, the lower has some really noticeable vignetting. You can see pretty strong light fall off near the corner. This is not unexpected, but maybe it's still a little bit more than what I would like to see. I think there are two main reasons for the strong vignetting. One is that the lens is reasonably compact and doesn't have a big extruded front element. If I put the lower next to the Canon, look at the front element. Even though the Canon is just a f4 lens, so one stop slower than the lower, the Canon has a much bigger and more extruded front element, which makes the Canon not able to take any front filter. The other reason is the lower lens doesn't use any lens profile correction to do any software adjustment to reduce vignetting. What we are seeing here is just exactly what the image captured by the lens without any correction. Stopping down the lower to f4 would reduce vignetting significantly. However, stopping down the lens further, even all the way to the minimum aperture f22, the lens still has a bit of vignetting. Now, let's compare it with the Canon RF 10 to 20 f4 lens again. If we enable Canon's lens profile correction, the Canon has only a very small amount of vignetting even at f4 that looks very nice. Then once we stop down to f5.6, then there is virtually no vignetting. However, if we disable Canon's lens profile correction, then we can see Canon also has lots of vignetting. It's even stronger than the lower. When we stop down the lens, 
the cannon still has some serious light fall off near the corner, even if we stop down all the way to F22. So without any lens profile correction, the Lauer actually has better vignetting performance than the Canon. However, with the Lauer, if you do want to minimize vignetting, you need to apply the vignetting correction yourself during post-processing as the camera or your raw software won't be able to do it automatically for you. Next, chromatic aberration. This Lauer lens has very minimal amount of chromatic aberration. Even when there's very high contrast, the lens has very minimal amount of chromatic aberration, so it's very impressive. Compared with the Canon, it seems the Canon has a little bit more chromatic aberration, but I really mean a little bit, and both lenses are excellent in this area. Lens flare is usually not Lauer's strongest area. I don't mean Lauer is terrible in lens flare, but quite often I do see quite a bit of lens flare when reviewing Lauer lenses. So with this lens being such a wide angle lens, I do wonder how would the lens flare performance be like. Here are some test videos I shot with this Lauer lens. I see a bit of rainbow color lens flare in the opposite direction to the camera and a little bit of ghosting. But overall, I think the lens flare control is actually pretty good, much better than I expected. Contrast also remains very good. However, when I did a side-by-side -side test with the Canon 10 to 20 RF lens, the result from the Canon is the best lens flare performance I've seen from pretty much any lens that I've ever used. It's almost perfect. To be fair, the Lauer is doing pretty good, but you can see there is still some room for improvements if you compare it with the Canon. I want to talk about sun stars now. Okay, the first interesting thing is, we only need to stop down the Lauer very slightly by just one third stop, and we can start to see a bit of sun stars. The sun stars are really sharp and clean, because the aperture has 5 braids, so the sun stars are 10 points. And my regular viewers would know this is my personal favorite sun star shape. As we stop down the lens, the tails of the sun stars become sharper and longer. But to be honest, even shooting at f4, the sun stars are already beautiful. It means when I'm shooting in the evenings, I don't have to stop down all the way to the minimum aperture to get some nice, sharp, beautiful sun stars. I could even just handheld the camera and shoot at f4 or f5.6 and still get some beautiful sun stars in my photo. And even if I do have a tripod, not having to stop down all the way to f16 or f22 means the image sharpness won't be affected by diffraction as diffraction usually start to make the image become softer from around f11 or f16. And let's do some comparison with the Canon lens. The Canon is also very interesting because with the Canon, I can get sun stars at f4 already, which is the maximum aperture. Now, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, the sun stars from the Canon at f4 isn't as clean as the Lauer, but it still looks pretty nice. With the Canon, you have to stop down to around f16 to get very sharp sun stars. I think both lenses create beautiful sun stars, but if you ask me, my choice would be the Lauer if I want to have some nice beautiful sun stars. Now, while I really like the sun stars from this lower 10mm lens, I understand that the sun stars may look a little bit too strong, a little bit too dominant for some people. So if that's the case, you should consider the 14 aperture braids version of this lower 10mm lens as the 14 braid aperture version is designed to give you sun stars that look a little bit more subtle. In terms of coma, if you look at this test photo I shot at f2.8, there is some pretty noticeable comma at the corner of the frame. Stopping down the lens to f4, comma becomes much better. If I compare it with the Canon at f4, the lower appears to be slightly better in terms of comma, 
as the cannon renders the street lights as 45 degrees oval shape flare. Interestingly, the Lawa Sunstars is really noticeable even at F4. You can start to see a bit of Sunstars already in this comma test photo, and it becomes even more noticeable when I stop down to F5.6. It's not something I see very often when I did similar coma tests with other lenses. We'll look at focus briefing now. This is my usual 1 meter to infinity focus briefing test. We can see the lens has very minimal amount of focus briefing. But ultra wide angle lens usually has minimum focus briefing, so this is not too surprising. The Canon RF 10 to 20 lens also has very minimal amount of focus briefing at 10 millimeter. Now, I want to talk about autofocus. So, if you are getting the 5 aperture braid version for either Nikon or Sony, then this lens would have autofocus. And as I've mentioned before, this is the first ever lower lens that has autofocus. So, I'm very curious to see how is the autofocus performance of this lens. To be honest, Autofocus is not really that important for such a wide angle lens. It is very easy to do manual focus as you have very deep depth of field. And very often when you shoot with such an ultra wide angle lens, you don't really need very good or fast autofocus performance. However, having autofocus does allow me to shoot very quickly or even just with one hand holding the camera. It's also quite useful when doing close-up photos as that is when you do have to focus more carefully to make sure your subject is in focus. Most of the close-up photos I shot with this lens, I just use autofocus and that really allows me to shoot the photo very quickly. And the autofocus performance of this lower lens is pretty good, much better than I expected. I was expecting to see some first generation rough and noisy autofocus performance, but the autofocus performance is actually very smooth and very fast. It's also very quiet as well. Not 100% silent, but it's quiet enough that I don't think videographers would notice the autofocus noise. It is also an internal focus lens, so the length of the lens and the position of the front element doesn't change during focusing. This probably means nothing for landscape photography, but this is very important for close-up photos. As I've mentioned before, the lens could be almost touching the subject when you are taking photo at the minimum focus distance, so you don't want the length of the lens or the position of the front element to change suddenly when you are trying to focus onto your subject. Okay, last but not least, let's talk about the design and build quality of this lens. To celebrate their 10th anniversary, Lauer has got a complete brand new design of this 10mm f2.8 lens. This is different not only to the typical Lauer lenses, it's also very different to any lenses in the market. I remember when Lauer first showed me the photo of this lens, I wasn't so sure whether I like it or not. But when I received the sample and I saw this lens in real life, I really like it. The pattern on the focus ring not only gives the lens a bit of futuristic vibe, but it also gives the focus ring a little bit more grip as well, which makes it easier to hold and also adjust the focus ring. I was chatting to Mr. Lee, founder of Lawa, about this new body design. I told him that I really like it, and he told me this is going to be the new design that Lawa will use for their lenses in the future. To me, this is a great news as I really love this new design. The body is made of metal, and it feels very solid. So it's not really a heavy lens, but it's definitely not lightweight as well. The lens weighs 420 gram, which is actually pretty good for a full frame 10mm f2.8 lens with full metal construction. Most of the ultra wide angle lenses in the market don't allow you to install any front filter, which is not ideal for landscape photography as we may want to use ND filter, CPL or other filters when shooting landscape photos. But luckily, this lower lens has a 77mm front filter thread at the front, which means you can install filters very easily. There's a small lens hood at the front of the lens. 
I thought the lens hood is integrated to the lens or in other words, not removable because the lens hood feels like a one piece design that is part of the metal body. But after using this lens for about one week, I suddenly discovered that I could remove the lens hood, which makes it a lot easier to install, remove or adjust filter that is attached to the lens. I feel so dumb as it took me a week to realize that. But now I'm telling you so you know the lens hood is removable. One thing I was surprised when I received the lens is that I don't see any USB connector on the lens at all and there's also no special docking station. So how do we update the firmware for this autofocus lens? Turns out for Nikon users, you just need to copy the lens firmware to a memory card and put it into your camera. And then you can just update the lens firmware using the camera menu system, just like updating the firmware for a Nikon first party lens. And for Sony users, you would use your computer and the lens firmware update software, just like how you update the firmware for the first party Sony lenses. So that's why there isn't a special USB port or docking station for this lens. I'm quite surprised because this is the first time I can update the firmware for a lens from a Chinese lens manufacturer so easily like this. And now I see Lauer managed to do that and it's just such a simpler and easier process. It does make me wonder why other Chinese lens manufacturer couldn't do the same thing as it's just so much easier for the users. On the metal lens mount, there is a rubber seal and this lens does have some basic weather resistant capability. I don't really know how long this review is, but this is probably one of my longest lens review. And the reason is because there are just so many things that I can discuss about this lens. Image quality wise, this lower is really good. Before I did all these comparisons with the Canon RF 10-20 f4L lens, I really wasn't sure what the result would be. But now I can say, apart from lens flare, which the Canon is just much better, but for everything else, the lower is just as good, if not even better than this Canon L lens. Now, the Canon is a zoom lens, so some may say it's not really a fair comparison. But then, the Canon is also three times the price of the lower and the maximum aperture is one stop slower. So for someone who do want an ultra wide angle lens that is just as wide as possible, the lower is not just a very cost effective choice, but it also delivers excellent image quality as well. And it's also a bit lighter and smaller too. The body design of this lower lens is also a big step up compared to pretty much all the previous Chinese lenses I have reviewed. While not everyone may like the aesthetic design of this lens, after all, it's quite a personal preference, but you just can't deny that Lauer has spent a lot of effort to create a unique design that is different from anything in the market. And that metal body build quality and the feeling when you touch the lens is also really good. One thing I also really like about this lower lens is its close-up capability. This lens allow me to take photo with 0.25 times maximum magnification with 130 degree super wide angle field of view. The only other lens that I'm aware of that can give me similar effect is Lauer's own 9mm f5.6 lens. That lens is even wider, but at the same time, it is two stops slower and not a autofocus lens and that also has quite a bit more distortion than this lens. I'm very happy to see Lauer keep innovating, improving and creating some new unique lenses for the market. With the brand new body design, this lens not only being their first autofocus lens, but it still has pretty decent autofocus performance and the image quality is pretty much Canon L lens level. This is definitely a big milestone for Lauer. But what do you guys think about this lens? Do you agree with what I said? Drop a comment below and let me know your thoughts. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this video.